And where do you currently reside? In Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and where did you reside before that? Uh, 796 EMA Lane in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and tell me, Ms. Johnson, what do you do for a living? Um, I work with autistic kids and behavioral health technician. And what did you do before that? I was working at eight hours for Luca, doing Luca. How long have you lived at your current address? Since March of this year. 796 Eden Berry address, how long did you live there? A year. Uh, do you remember when you moved it, moved into that home? December 1st of 2021. And was that a rental property or a, a, or a house you owned? It was a rental property. And were you the primary person on the lease? I was. You were the one who signed the lease? I am. And were you the one who paid the rent every month at that property? Yes, I was. Were all the utilities and everything in your name? Yes, they was. Uh, Ms. Johnson, you know why you're here today? I do. I want to talk about the incident that brings you here today. I want to take you back to November 26, 27 of 2022, okay? Okay. Do you remember the night, November 26, 2022? I do. Tell us what happened that night. I was home studying for my RBT certificate. Um, I get a phone call from my girlfriend on a three-way FaceTime call, um, inviting me to go out for one of their birthdays. I agree to go out. I get up, I prepare to get dressed to go outside. Um, during our conversation, uh, was, we was getting dressed, whatever. During our conversation, um, I let Demonte know where I was going. Um, that was it. I got ready to go. I leave out. We go to one club. Well, let's go back. Okay. Tell us approximately what time it is at night. 11. Like okay. 10 or 11. About 11 o'clock at night on November 26th. Correct. Correct. And Demonte's at the house with you? He was. And what about your kids? They were there as well. And where were, where were they at at that point? My two daughters were asleep in their room, and my newborn was with Demonte. Okay. Was the newborn asleep at that point? She was. Uh, was she sleeping in the crib? She was. And so you get the call 11 o'clock at night, you get dressed, you let Demonte know where you're going. What happens after that? Um, I leave to go out. I get to, we go to one club. What was the name of the club? Zari. Okay. Um, we're there, just partying, we leave that club around two, go to the eighth hour, which is the eighth hour that I w was working at. And what's the name of the place you were working? It's called Taste. Okay. Um, we get there, we're there for about an hour. Um, my girlfriends and another coworker gets into an altercation. I, go to the bathroom, I communicate the altercation with Demonte. Um, we stay for a little bit longer. They get into, the, like, the altercation rear card, they now about to fight. We leave the, at the hour. Well, let's go back. About what time is this when you communicate with Demonte about the altercation? Now this is about four. Okay. And when you say communicate, was it a text message or a phone call? I called him. I went to the bathroom and called him. And was he up at 4 a.m.? He was. Okay. And you actually talked to him? I did. And then what happens after that? Um, he advised me that he was going to send someone to make sure I was okay. I let him know I was okay. It wasn't me that was in a fight with my girlfriends and they were relieving. And that I was showing my location with him. And what did you do next? I shared my location with him. Um, we left. We, me and my girlfriends met up at the local gas station because my car needed gas to figure out where we were going to go next, because I didn't want to go home. Now, uh, tell us, what was your relationship to, to DeMonte at this time? He was my baby father. Okay. Uh, and uh, was he living with you at this time? He was staying there. He had him living there. Uh, tell me what you mean by staying. So when I say staying, so, when we get back to when I am my daughter, because that's how it leads up to him staying here. So, um, he he was incarcerated, he got incarcerated in August. Um, 
I got a phone call back in August of his incarceration. I helped him get out or whatever. And when he gets out late September, he expressed that he had nowhere to go. That the house that he was staying to prior to getting incarcerated, he couldn't stay there no more because his friend mom was tripping, is what he said. Um, I had the baby, I did allow him to come, you know, to be with the baby and stay there since he had nowhere to go. Uh, and while you're out that particular night, uh, did you have anything to drink? I did. What did you drink? Casamigos. How much? Probably like two or three shots. And was it at the first place or the second place? That was at the first place. Uh, and did you have anything to drink at the second location? I did. So after you let him know the altercation at the second location, share your, uh, tell him you'll drop the location, where do you go next? What happens next? We go to the end, I would call future. Now, is that the spot you worked at? No, I worked at Taste. The future is a different end hour. Uh, and about what time is it now? You now it's about six, maybe roughly seven. So this is an after, after hours after. Yes. spot. Okay. Uh, and do you have your phone on you? I do. Tell us what happens next. Um, I finally arrive into Taste. Um, I leave. I have two phones. I left one phone in the car because it has the audio malfunction. I can't hear out of it. I take my personal phone inside the club with me. Um, I get there. I'm smoking hookah. I, my phone dies while I'm in there. Once my phone dies, I leave. Why do you have two phones? Because I want to close the night. Okay. Uh, and is one phone business and one phone personal? Correct. So you left your business phone in your car and took your personal phone inside? Yes. Uh, and you said while you were in there, your phone died? Yes. Do you remember what time or around what time you realized that your phone had died? I don't because it was dead. Okay. Uh, but at some point, you realize your phone is dead and is that when you leave the club? Yes. All right, mm -hmm. tell, tell, tell us what happens after that. I leave the club, I go back to my car, um, I immediately put my phone on the charger. What, what time is it when you realize, when you actually realize what time is it? Like what, what time is it? Or around what time is it? Around nine or something. Okay. And tell us what happens next. Um, my phone cuts on. My phone cuts on. I'm seeing the text messages from my aunts. Um, a few text messages from Dolo. I meet out with my aunts. Text messages. I look the first ones on there. Um, as I'm reading the messages, my aunts call. I answer the phone call, it's mine. Um, what's, what's Rochelle's last name? Noel. And what's Andrea's last name? Gonzalez. Okay. Um, we're on the th we're all on the three right now. Andrea's hysterical. She's, where the F have you been? Um, Dodo said she was in a fight. I've been calling hospitals, police department. Um, I reassured them that Demonte had my location. And I let them know where I was and that everything was okay. Um, as I'm letting them know that everything's okay, Rochelle um, adds Dolo into the, Demonte into the phone call. Um, so, Rochelle, so now it's you on the phone, your aunt Rochelle Newell, your aunt Andrea Gonzalez, and then Rochelle adds Demonte Smith onto the phone call. Yes. Okay. And what happens next? Uh, Demonte gets on the phone, um, he gets on the very Where the F you been at? Um, you, you, you tripping, you think I'm a lame. I tell him, I said, you know where I've been at, you're in my location. He then says, when you get here, I'm gonna meet you at hey. And he hangs up. And both your aunts were on the phone? Yes. And this happened while all three, all four of you are on the phone? Yes. And then he hangs up? Yes. Right, tell us what happens after that. After he hangs up, I, my aunt is now against her. I know he just said it. I tell her, don't worry about it. I'm going to call the police. I grab my business phone and I immediately call number one. Okay. And what happens next? I call number one. I let them know that I'm en route to my home, that I'm, I just received a verbal. Um, a verbal, and the text, at the time I see the text message of him text me that he was going to be my ASS on crib. Um, I did let them know I'm receiving verbal and text messages threats. And I'm get beaten when I get home by my 
Well, I told him at the time my boyfriend and that I was scared to go home and I needed authorities to help me. Now, was there any reason why you took these threats seriously? Yes, because two, um, not even two weeks ago, he followed through with his threats before. Okay. Uh, when you say he followed through with his threats, what do you mean? Um, around two weeks ago, prior to the 26th, um, I was working at the taste restaurant at, at the eighth hour, and he threatened to beat my ASS again. And when I came in the house, he was coming down the steps and he then slammed me on my face. Okay. When you say judge made the witness step down, yes. I want you to show us what happened you know, prior prior to that. Uh, you can use me. So I'm coming in the house. I come in the house at first. I, you need to speak up. You okay, I'm sorry. I'm coming in the house. As I come in the house, I'm thinking like he's hiding behind the door. I look behind the door. He wasn't behind the door. He was actually coming down the steps. He came. Okay. So I'm you. He's right. coming down the steps. When I walked in the door, he came like this. He came on my face. And he still has my, he has my coat. He's like this. Like, like this, this is a, it's like saying stuff to me, I start to cry. Once I start crying, he then just goes and I tell him he has to go. Yeah, you can go back up. <clears throat> and Miss Johnson, after that incident, so he slams you on your face, is over you, shaking you. And when did he stop? When I began to cry. And did you call the police? I did. What did you do next? I asked him to leave. I went upstairs and I contacted his mom, or tried to contact his mom. Oh. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show her, Your Honor, what's marked as defense exhibit one. You take a look at this. Johnson. Do you recognize that text message exchange? I do. Oh, uh, and who was that text message exchange between? Myself and Demonte's mother. And uh, is that text message the same message you sent Demonte's mother the day that uh, he slammed you on your face? Yes. Uh, has anything been changed or altered about it at all? No. Is it in the same or similar condition as when you sent that text message? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, we will move to admit Defense Exhibit 1, uh, text message between uh, Ms. Johnson and DeMonte's mother into evidence. Hey, yes, Judge. Um, Maybe approach. Still with me, Ted Spaulding, what they're doing right now as you're watching along with us is trying to get an exhibit in, marking that so you're not missing any of her testimony. But Ted, really smart move by the defense. The defense attorney, when we could hear her and not see her, here's what we know from the field producer notes that are there in the courtroom. And that is she got out of the witness stand, she went before the jury box, and she demonstrated with her attorney what she says happened when Michael Sterling, the um, that's her attorney, when the victim in the case slammed her and he and, and she threw him to the ground demonstrating that I think that's brilliant yeah I think it is especially getting right up close to the jury you want the jury to feel as if they're in that moment um, and so obviously we didn't get to see exactly how she did it and and all of that but hopefully she was prepared for it because obviously the jury is going to be looking at her almost every second yeah um, you know what her reaction is all of that and brilliant move like you said you want to bring that jury into that emotional aspect of it this is what this whole case is about it is and demonstrative aids I always preach about they should be used more than they are but this is a great one we can see their live shot so you see what they're doing talking to the judge you're not missing testimony but the other thing I have to ask you about so right now she's 
testifying about an incident two weeks before the shooting occurred. And she's saying that's when the defendant slammed her on the ground. She called the police. She then sent a text to DeMonte's mother. That's what they're discussing right now. We'll see if that's allowed in or not. But again, I think the defense is trying to say this is her mindset. She was afraid of him. She was in reasonable fear because of the way he had abused her or treated her in the past. That's right. They're, they're building brick by brick that wall. So this is one of the incidents, as we heard earlier, that they're going to get to others um, with maybe a police report, we'll see what gets into evidence there, um, she'll be able to testify to those things. So you're building this wall with these bricks to show, look at all these different instances that are creating this mindset that she has going into this event um, in the early hours of, of this day uh, where he loses his life. So great move by them. Let me ask you this, and I'm not judging, I'm just saying if I were on the jury, I would question, if you were this fearful of this man who is the child, one of the children's fathers, why would you leave again all four of your children with him in the home two weeks after this happened and he, and he slammed her to the ground and, and after we know there was also an incident between him and her 12 year old. So is the jury going to think about that and say this doesn't make sense. Why would she even leave him there in the first place? Yes, absolutely. And the prosecutor is going to remind them of those things. So all we're hearing right now is obviously the defense side. Um, so it sounds real bad, but the prosecutor's going to get up. Sorry to cut off. Let's go back into the courtroom. Number one with the redaction is it without the text. Ms. Johnson, what's the date on that text message? Sunday, November 15, 2022. And that text message was to uh, Mr. DeMonte Smith's mother? Yes. Tell us what you told Mr. Smith's mother. And the Monty slammed me on my face, on the ground, on my face. And I was trying not to take it too far. And why don't you read the text message exactly for us, the one, just the one you sent? The Monty just slammed me to the ground on my face. I'm trying not to take this too far in my situation. Can you please call and can you please call and have him take a walk and give me some space right now, please? And and this was right after the incident you just showed us? <laughs> and when you text his mom, I know his situation, what did you mean? Um, I was just getting released from jail. And when you said I didn't want to take it too far, what did you mean? Call authorities, yeah, and be arrested. Right. So on the night of November, I guess the morning, so that happened, what was the date again? November 13th. It's 6 a.m. So on the morning of November 27, when you see these text messages and on the phone with your auntie get these verbal threats, is that why you took it so serious? Absolutely. And you called 911. Mm -hmm. right. And tell us what happens after you call 911. Um, when I called 911, I know that I was receiving threats verbally and through text messages. Um, I asked them. Um, he asked my ass to me home because I was scared for my life. I did let them know that he did prior to this threat, um, threatened me prior to this and followed through with it. He was supposed to be, he followed through with his threat prior. Um, they told me that they were just patient when come out and that was it. And then what happened after that? And then uh, minutes later I get a call from Oscar Lamy on her personal phone. Um, I answered her, she lets me know that she was at the at my location, being at my home. Um, I tell her that I'm in route. She asked me to give her basically like a summary, a summary of what was going on. I informed her that I was receiving threats from my baby father and that he had prior to this incident put his hands on me. Um, she asked me if he lives with me. I told him that he just got out of jail and that he stays there. And she tells me that she'll be there, she'll be there, or she'll see me when I get there, basically. Okay. Uh, and about how far were you from your house when you talked to, so you talked to 911, and then you talked to Officer Laney directly. And then about how far were you from your house when you talked to Officer Laney? Probably about 15 minutes, too. Okay. And then tell us what happens 
And, and where are, are you still on the phone with your aunt at this time? <laughs> we're both of them on the phone, Rochelle and Andrea. And then tell us what happens after that. Um, after Miss Smith also gave me dis disconnects, she called me a couple minutes later and told me that she had been dispatched to another situation that she had to attend to that one and to, she let me know to call number one again to dispatch and let them know that she was to come back out and that I was told to call to give her dispatch back. And, uh, and so she tells you she's been dispatched again when you get close, just call again. Yes. And what did you do? When I got closer, I called again. Uh, did you call her personal phone directly? Or? I called her one. Okay. And what happened? I called her one, let them know that I was closer. Um, I let them know that I was in the area and that I didn't go to the house. And that I was told by an officer that they had already came out to call her one again to have her dispatch and that she would be fairly close and that to wait for her to come in. And what did you do? I waited. And where were you waiting at? Outside of a cross a cross by my go set. And tell us what happens after that. Um, I waited a little longer and then I called again. And when I called again, I let them know that I had been waiting. At this time, I didn't know how long I was waiting. I had dozed off for a second. So when I called back, I let them know where I say that I've been waiting for about an hour. Um, the dispatcher gets my information, he informs me that he do see the calls, the prior calls, and that someone was on their way. Um, and then someone just would be around. Okay. Uh, when you doze off, are your aunt still on the phone? They do. Okay. Uh, and so you've talked to 911 once, they dispatched Officer Lamey. You talked to Officer Lamey, explained the situation when she was there waiting for you. You talked to her again when she went to dispatch somewhere else. You called 911 again when you got there. You fell asleep for a while and called 911 again. I did. And they said they would dispatch somebody. They did. And then what happened after that? And when I was on phone with my aunts, I didn't look at my alarms and something, I'm looking at the cameras. I didn't notice that the camera that was in my bedroom had been turned around. So I then triggered my alarm system, my other alarm system they have. They just been triggered to reach out to me and ask me if I needed a 30s. Oh, uh, and did your alarm, did that work? It did. And what happened? Um, the dispatcher called me, asked me if I needed assistance. I did inform her that I wanted her to dispatch police officers and that I needed to be escorted into my home. Okay. And then approximately, and then approximately how much longer did you wait uh, for someone to be dispatched? I go to get impotent. That's when I talked to the female officer. Okay. And told her about my kids being in the home and that I was concerned about the well being. I didn't know what was going on in my home and that Devontae was mad and I didn't know if my kids were okay or not. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, and what happens after that? I leave from the parking spot that I was at and I leave out of my court, well, leave out of the area to flag down a police officer. And did you find a police officer to flag down? I did. And who was that? Um, officer Cross was parked. I flagged him down and asked him to leave out of bit. Okay. And did he follow you back? He did. And tell us what happens after that. He followed me back, we were driving my home. I got out of the car and got inside his car. He asked me, um, no, tell him about the text I told him I was receiving threatening text messages. Um, he knocks on the door, he asked him to come out, he doesn't. I did not inform him that I have a fire. He asked me, is there any weapons in the home? I tell him, not, no, there isn't. If anything, it's a kitchen, he's using a kitchen, kitchen utensil. I have my firearm on me. He asked me to place my firearm on the car. I do so. Um, at this point, also Amy is walking up. Um, they asked me to unlock the door and step back. I did so. Can I ask you, Ms. Johnson, why did you wait so long for authorities to escort you or be with you at the house? Because I was scared to answer. Okay. Uh, 
Now, tell us what happens after that. Uh, when you when they, you unlock the you unlock the door, Officer Lamy asks Demonte to come out. Tell us what happens next. It takes him a while to come out. He then comes out with my daughter, my newborn, in his arms. Now, you were showing Officer Lamy surveillance video of what was happening inside the house at some point. All right, she is now talking about what happened at the date in question, 27th of November. And you're not going to want to miss it. We're going to hit the pause button, so we'll get back to the testimony. She starts to talk about when she got into mama mode. Remember, four kids in the house with DeMonte. You're watching Court TV, your front row seat to justice. I started hearing the stories about murder and stuff. I'm about to be the biggest drug dealer that you can become. <laughs> Oh my God, are they starting a war with me or what? I'm not gonna lie, it felt good to be a gangster. She just points the gun out of my face. Boom, 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 boom. Just shoots me. We knew that what we were doing had consequences, but we just didn't care. Vice on Court TV, tonight at 7, 6 Central, only on Court TV. Get you back now to the Georgia murder trial for the defendant Quinesha Johnson. She stands accused of fatally shooting her boyfriend Demonte Smith last November and it happened after police came to the couple's home because of a domestic violence complaint made by the defendant herself. She's claiming self-defense. She now has that opportunity. She's telling the jury in her own words what happened on that fateful night. We're gonna go right back in where we left off. I'm sorry, Officer Cross. Uh, what were you showing him? I was showing him moving around at home. Uh, was it DeMonte moving around? Could you tell from the it surveillance? Was and did he have the baby in his arms when he was moving around in the home? No, he did. Uh, but when the officer, when he, the, when you unlocked the door and Officer Laney asked him to come out, he came out with the two months. He did. Uh, and approximately what time is it, if you remember? Uh, okay. Uh, and so when he comes out, what's going through your mind? What happens? I immediately go into parents and move of the love and my daughter being outside. It's Gwen's head and he sort of like hurt in the head and six degree, six degree weather, you know whatever. And what happens after that? I asked him, can he ask him to put my daughter in, you know? And then Officer Krause instruct Mr. Smith to give you your daughter so you could take her in the house? He does. <coughs> and did he follow the officer's instructions? He did. Now, tell us what happens between you and DeMonte while the officers are there. Um, after I asked for him to get my baby so I could take her in the house, he then goes to say, B-I-C-C-H, this is my baby too. You wasn't worried about her, you was out all night being a thought, effing, and effing men. Um, he just started to become disrespectful. Um, I became respond I responded to the disrespect, telling him that his name is him on the first ticket and second he's not his daughter. Um, he calls me a stripper, I calls him broke. I don't um, Now, were you scared at that point? I was still scared, but I felt like I was able to respond to his disrespect. Why was that? Because the cops were there and I didn't think that they would leave us alone. And you had put your firearm in the car? I did. Can I ask you, I mean, you had your firearm on you uh, when he was threatening you. You could have just gone to your house with your firearm. Why would you call police? Because I wasn't. I never would have thought it. I, I wanted these to protect me. I was never thinking of it in my own at all. Uh, so tell us what happens after. So you and him argue back and forth. We've all seen it. Uh, you've been here through the trial. We've all seen it. And then tell us what happens uh, as, uh, as as y'all as the argument is ensuing and police officers are about to leave. Tell us what happens. Um, officer, okay, so Officer Lamy asked me a question. She asked me, she said, she's telling me that he stays here. She's asking me, um, how does he, 
for something about him staying here. And I told her, and explained to her that he had just got out of the Cape County Jail and that I was allowing him to stay there. He has no residence there. I'm letting her know that his name is not on the lease or nothing. As I'm telling her that she's trying to tell me something else. So it appeared that I was like talking over her, but I was just finishing my explanation of him not having a residence here as for them, asking them to remove him from the household. Officer Frost then tells me he can go back inside with the baby. He goes inside. I'm standing in the threshold of the doorway. As he walks past me, he tells me when the cops leave, he's gonna be my ass. And and were you you were you on the phone with someone? I never got off the phone. My parents was on the phone the entire time. Were both of them on the phone? Yes, they were. And that's Rochelle knew Andrea Gonzalez. Yes. And he says when the cops leave, I'm gonna beat your ass. Yes. And do you inform the cops of what he's just said? Immediately. And what do they do? What, what's their response? I asked them, I said, did y'all just hear him? I repeated what he just said. They didn't say, I don't believe they said anything. And what happens after that? Um, I asked, um, continuing to speak as of, okay, so what am I to do in a matter of defending myself? I did say, if I shoot him out of self-defense because he keeps putting his hands on me, then I held accountable. And what? And what's the response? Also, then he says, if you do that, just be, make sure you get your to it in court. And what do the officers do next? Well, and you're, and Demonte's in the house. Yes. And they leave you at the house. Yes. Tell us what happens after that. Um, in the midst of them walking off and me, me being a dress room in my doorway, my dogs had got out. Um, my dogs walked down the street, well, running down the street. My daughter's, my Nala is now in the doorway, helped me get the dogs back in the home. I tend to go up the street to get my dogs, I bring them back. Um, I advise my dogs to go in the house prior to going inside my home. I do go to my car to retrieve my firearm and a tire Now, Ms. Johnson, you said that you were licensed to care. I am. Tell us what it means to be licensed to care. Um, to be able to hold a firearm and, of course, defense leaders like your safety and protection. What, what are requirements you had to go through to obtain a license to care? Um, FBI clearance. Uh, anything else? No, Georgia didn't. No, Georgia don't. You don't need to permit a license carry in the state of Georgia. So, no. uh, so well, they can't check. I did with that yeah, Okay. So you go outside to get your dogs run outside. You go outside to get your dogs. Uh, and while you're outside, you go to your car and you grab your firearm. Where do you put your firearm? In my right sweatpants pocket. And you grab anything else? A uh, tire rod. Okay. Uh, and when you say a tire, how big is it? How thick is it? It's not really that it thick, by this thick, and probably about this long. Now, why did you grab your firearm and the tire rod? I grabbed my firearm and put my firearm in the overseas in the car as it goes into my home in the box. Approaching the top of the hour, thanks to Ted Spaulding again for joining us this hour. Michael Ayala joining me up next. And guess what? You don't want to miss this because we will see the defendant do another reenactment before the jury, this time of how she confronts DeMonte. Stay tuned, Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcox. And I'm Michael Ayala. And we're both here today giving you your front row seat to justice. We do want to get straight back to the self-defense or murder trial where the jury has been hearing from the defendant, Quanisha Johnson. And she's been testifying about exactly what happened not only on the night of the shooting, but two weeks prior when she claims DeMonte uh, slammed her in the face. Now, she demonstrated that for the jury. And as I understand it, we may see her demonstrate something else. Let's get you right back in where we left off. And after you grab it, put your dogs in the house, tell us what happens after that. I go in the home, my daughters are downstairs in the living room here. I hand both of them home. I tell them what well, I had to home. I had the memory of home. I tell them to call the cops, let them know they're scared. 
And why did you give your daughters a phone? So you contacted 911 multiple times. Police have responded. They've been at the scene. You've talked to them. Now you have your daughters calling 911. Why do you have your daughters calling 911? Because the cops didn't hear from me, so I felt like they were here from a minor child. And you tell both of them to call now? I did. And what do you do now? I didn't go upstairs to retrieve my two month old baby. That's the, the youngest baby. You go upstairs to get the two month old. Yes. And you got the tire iron in your hand? I do. All right, and tell us what happens next. I get upstairs as I get to the top of the step, the my is coming out of the bedroom. I then back into the hallway. He's coming at me, he's telling me. Um, police ASB for calling the cops. Um, he says, I'm gonna beat you at A again when the cops leave. I tell him if he hit me, I show him the tire rods. If he hit me, I'm gonna hit you with this. Will you, will you step down for us, Ms. Johnson? I just want to be able to get a visual. I'm, let's say, I'm you. I got the tire rod in my hand. You come up the stairs and your bedroom is this way, right? I'm sorry, show, show me again. So, I'm going to set my bedroom. bedroom is right here. Okay, and so you're coming up the stairs. I want to set this kind of out of the bigger. Okay, now, what was your two month old man? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so, I was on the bedroom. So, let's do it this way so the jury has a new. So, this is, let's say this is the hallway. Right? And, uh, so, I'm coming up the stairs. Okay. And at this point, he's saying things to you. Ms. Johnson, I know it's difficult to go back to that moment, but tell me what was going through your mind at that moment? I knew he was going to be um, me. why did you feel, why did you feel uh, that you had to defend yourself? I couldn't be him. I mean, I knew he was going to hurt me. I didn't go to the cops. The cops left. I knew he was mad about that. I knew he was mad about me and how he said he was going to be me, he's done it before. I just knew it was going to happen. And he, he lunged at you? He did. And at that moment, you just pulled your gun out? I did. One shot? Yes, sir. And you've heard the recording that you say, Bob, I did. tell us what was going through your mind. At that point, I, I can't even tell you, honestly. I, I just know. I shot and it was just like, I know, um, I don't, I don't, like, I just know that I was, I had to defend myself. And where were your daughters at? They were downstairs. And do you remember telling your daughters, tell them he hit me? As, I was, as we were walking out, I do recall saying that as we were like, and once we got outside, I do recall saying that. But you told the detective he didn't hit you? Yes. He just came at you, lunged at you? Yes, I told him he didn't hit me that day. Yes. And you felt like you had to do it to defend yourself from being injured by him again? Yes. And did you go down and give the police a statement? I did. Did you fully cooperate? I did. Did you tell them what had happened? I did. Did you give them access to your cell phone? I did. And what about the surveillance video in your house? I gave them access to this one. Uh, and when you, you went outside, what did you what did you say to the police who were still waiting outside? That I told him he was going to do it. And what happened after that? 
was handcuffed and put to the police car. So you didn't have your phone or anything on you at that point? I didn't. Did you ever go back to that location? I didn't. Did anybody in your family ever go back to that location? They went once. They went to retrieve some of my items from my daughters because my daughters were transported to Philadelphia. Um, once they got there, my house was flooded. My cameras was ripped out of the wall. Everything was damaged. My roof was caved in. So it wasn't nothing really solid. Ms. Johnson, how did it make you feel knowing what had happened? It still made me feel the same way. I never wanted it to happen. I didn't intend for it to happen. I didn't mean for it to happen. But in that moment, you felt like you had to defend yourself. I did. No further questions, Grandma. Judge, may we take a break um, for Ms. Johnson? Yes, five minutes. Okay.